Jerusalem, the Contested City Lecture 13 Through New Eyes Jerusalem and the Moderns uh, We stand now at the very beginning of the 19th century, uh, at a point in which probably Jerusalem had reached its, its nadir. The city was probably the smallest and the poorest it was throughout its long history, perhaps since the days of the Canaanites. The cause of this was, uh, as I mentioned last time, it was maladministration on the part of the Ottoman authorities. It was the slow decrease, the decline in the pilgrimage trade, which was the only business that Jerusalem really had. Uh, and that was caused by the, the difficulty of communications, problems of getting to the city. Uh, in the middle of this, in the middle of this century, uh, cholera breaks out in uh, in the Middle East and Europe, which also cuts into this this travel. And as I say, that these, this is the only source of income for Jerusalem. And as the the number of tourists decreases, the income of the government and of the locals also begins to decrease. And the city, the infrastructure of the city, the services begin to crumble, and and, and in some cases to disappear. The various religious communities lose their property; they have to sell their property because they're so deeply in debt. It is not a very good time. But there is something else that is happening which is very much in the other direction. And it is the, the presence, the renewed presence of, um, of European capitalism and political influence inside the city. Jerusalem is a very small place and for Palestine is a very small province on a much larger stage called the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire was the chief Muslim power in, in the world at the time, and it had to deal with its other with the other powers of Europe. And at the beginning of its reign, it was uh, the beginning of its term, it was, it was fairly impressive and foreboding and dangerous to the Europeans, but the balance of power eventually shifted in the other direction, and the Ottomans progressively weakened as the European powers got stronger. There were a series of treaties that were made between the Ottomans and European powers, and the first of them was made with France in 1535, and these are called capitulations. And capitulation doesn't have anything to do with surrendering or, or, or caving in. It has to do with the technical term of the, the way the thing was divided up. But what a, what a capitulation was was a tr treaty of a commercial treaty between two sovereign powers in which they agreed to ex to exchange ambassadors and have legations in each other's country and to grant each other commercial privileges in their own country and to grant to the other the ability to come and have merchants come and, and set up shop in their country and to enjoy a kind of extraterritoriality, uh, you know, immunity from the laws of the country. And the way these things were set up is that they were symmetrical, that the French gave these privileges to the Ottomans, and the Ottomans gave this privilege to the French. But as a matter of real fact, the Ottomans never much took advantage of these grants that were made to them by the French. What it was, as these capitulations, one followed the other through the other European powers, is that the European powers, it meant, got a foothold inside of the abode of Islam, a commercial foothold, a kind of political foothold, uh, it's the beginning of the system of consuls, consulships, and of foreign representation and extraterritoriality, and even more dangerously, the notion of a of a protectorate. Because there came along with these with these capitulations the notion that the French, for example, should have something to say about those people who are, as the treaty called them, of the French religion, whatever that was. Uh, in the Middle East, so that there was a grant of powers of protection to certain subjects of the Ottomans that they granted to the French. And so as these things extended, uh, all of the European powers eventually had representation inside the Ottoman Empire. And since we're concerned with Jerusalem and Palestine, that the first consulate in inside Jerusalem, the first foreign representation, was set up by the British in 1838, and eventually all the other European powers followed suit. They, they opened up consulates in Jerusalem, including the United States of America. Not only that, and, and eventually, I mean, very quickly before the end of the century, all the European powers, everything from Russia to Norway, had consul, consulates inside the city of Jerusalem. And they imported with them, of course, all of their rivalries from Europe, 
the 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 same thing the the cold war that prevailed in europe among these powers also prevailed in in the middle east and in more specifically in jerusalem and they also each one of them since they were extraterritorial and had privileges of immunity the same privileges of immunity were extended to the people who were attached to the consulate, to their employees, to their, including the, some of the local people. It is it is the same sort of um, problem that the United States occasionally faces with with the notions of foreign of their military bases in in other countries of whether or not people soldiers stationed the military stationed on Okinawa, for example, or in, in in Germany, are subject to the local laws and subject to local sort of administration. This is a this is still a sore point in when one country has representation of some sort in another, and it was not exactly a sore point yet, but it had the makings of such. It certainly established in inside of Jerusalem now from the middle on through the 19th century uh, European presences, European secular presences that had not really been there since the time of the Crusades that. There had always been monks there. There had been clerics there, Latin clerics, and Greek Orthodox and Armenian clerics. There, there were these clerical, little clerical communities there. But now we have secular, national representatives who live in Jerusalem as well. And of course, there comes in with them, eventually, all the services that they might uh, that they might expect. That there were hotels that are opened inside. Most of these things took place inside the Jaffa Gate. That's the main western entry to the old city of, of Jerusalem. And it's inside that gate that is opened up in the mid-century, the first European-style hotel. And soon there are two hotels there. There's a postal service that all of these sort of European infrastructure things begin to be established in inside of, uh, of Jerusalem. And so that, that, so that the, consul, the consulate slash commercial uh, way into Jerusalem is now opened up, but it turns out that there are that there are two other ways uh, in which European powers and Western influence begins to show up in the city of Jerusalem. One is the arrival of missionaries, uh, Western missionaries, and the second is the arrival of what can be called archaeological institutes. These are the two other pathways in which Western powers begin to influence the goings-on in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, first of all, the, the missionary approaches. that the there, were, there had always been clerics, as I say, in, in the city of Jerusalem. But one of the things that was that was out of the question in, in terms of, of clerics is proselytizing, that you really simply couldn't proselytize among the Muslims. This was forbidden by the Dhimma, the, the concordat that Muslims use. But this is now a different kind of situation. The foreigners who are coming in to Jerusalem, these Europeans, are all protected. They're immune people. They are not subject to the laws of the Ottoman Empire, and so they have a much freer reign. Now, as a matter of fact, the missionaries who came in, Protestant, French, Catholic missionaries, Protestant missionaries, the British and the Americans uh, brought in Protestant missionary uh, institutes and, and groups into Jerusalem, they they offered a variety of services. It was generally the kind of services they provided, the clinics, for example, and the literature that they provided, which 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 were the things that attracted uh, the local population. It's not as if, however, a lot of uh, converts were made among the Muslims. There was not any sort of notable kind of progress made in converting Jerusalem's Muslims to Christianity. Where there was uh, a distinct attempt was uh, on the part of the British to convert the Jews of Jerusalem. The French had declared themselves, I mean, part of this protectorate mentality is that the French had declared themselves and gotten themselves um, acknowledged as the protectors of any kind of European Christians who were in in Jerusalem. So the Latin community, the Latin, the, the Catholic community in Jerusalem was under the, under the guidance of the French. And anybody else who wanted to sort of get under that particular umbrella. And the uh, Russians had claimed protectorate over all the Orthodox, right? the Greek Orthodox, the Armenian Orthodox, any any Orthodox group, the Russians claimed that they were the protectors. See, this was the great game that was going on, the great 19th century political rivalry that was going on between France and Britain and Prussia and Russia. 
And part of the counters in this thing were the protectorates of these eastern communities. The French had carved out their position. The Russians had carved out their position as protectors of the Orthodox. The British, uh, the route the British went down, the, the missionary route the British went down, was the route of the Jews. And there was a, there was founded in London a, a, in 1839, a London Society for the Promotion of Christianity Among the Jews. And it had it as its object, not, not the Jews of Jerusalem in the first instance, but as a, as a way of converting Jews everywhere, right? In, including in England. And the first Anglican bishop of Jerusalem, the first Anglican bishop appointed anywhere outside of Great Britain, was appointed in 1841, and his name was Michael Solomon Alexander, and he was himself a Jewish convert. And the thought was that this would be one way of proceeding in Jerusalem, is that the Jews of Jerusalem might be attracted to this Anglican form of Christianity. What they were attracted to, uh, some converts were made, but what chiefly attracted them, uh, I'm not sure about the Anglican form of Christianity, but the clinic that the that this missionary institute ran uh, in in uh, Jerusalem was very attractive, and there were a number of rather famous converts made. Uh, famous, I should say, celebrated in the sense that they got high profiles because they were part of this push. But so that these missionary institutes, the the missionary attempts, were, were one form in which Westerners got their foot into Jerusalem, uh, and the other one was through archaeology. Nineteenth uh, century really was sort of the birth century of, of scientific archaeology. Uh, it's interesting that travelers had passed through that holy land for centuries and centuries and, and paid no attention to the Greek and the Roman remains that were surrounding them on all sides, they just as if they didn't exist. They weren't there to admire paganism. They were there to admire religious sites. But anyway, the first serious archaeologist, the first you know, trained archaeologist and biblical scholar to show up in Jerusalem was an American, as a matter of fact. His name was um, uh, Edward Robinson, and he was uh, on the faculty of the Union Theological Seminary in New York, and he was in in uh, Jerusalem in 1838 and uh, began to inspect now the biblical sites, not only in Jerusalem but throughout Palestine, and to try to put the study of the Bible on some kind of materially sound basis of connecting it with the actual remains and making some sort of uh, attempt to understand the meaning of the remains. But this was a, it was really the British, right, who came into Jerusalem in force. Robinson was uh, one sort of uh, unique, almost, American, uh, although Americans continue to have interest in the place. But it's the British who made the first sort of institutional move. And a, uh, a Palestine exploration fund was set up in London in 1865. But even before that, the British, and, and again, it's, it's, most of these things take place with the cooperation or through the Royal Corps of Engineers. The British began to ta- undertake a, a survey of Palestine, right? And including a survey of Jerusalem. So that between 1864 and 1865, an engineer named Charles Wilson, um, and others from the Corps of Royal Engineers, systematically mapped out Jerusalem. There was an ordnance survey of, of Jerusalem, and which is which is a very, very valuable document because they, they had a pretty much free reign of the city. This was before the Ottomans really quite understood about this archaeology business. The, there was a kind of golden window of opportunity there as far as archaeology was concerned, which didn't last terribly long, maybe maybe 20 years or so in which the Ottomans didn't know or didn't care what these people with the measuring devices and the spades were doing in various places around Jerusalem. So Charles Wilson's survey in of 1864-65 uh, was then followed by another man named Charles Warren, who began actually to excavate parts of the city and to do soundings around the Haram al-Sharif, the southern part and the western part of the Haram al-Sharif, to, 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 to begin to actually excavate, to, do, to perform excavations in the city. So this is, this is the beginning of a kind of scientific archaeology, and it's, it's done, the Palestine Exploration Fund is, not, is, is an institute, it's not just simply one archaeologist, and in 1890, the, the, the French Dominicans set up their École Biblique, another research institute. In 1895, 
The American School of Oriental Research was opened in Jerusalem as a place where, where, where archaeologists could work under the cooperative patronage of American universities. And the Germans had their uh, Palestina fund as well. And so these foreign governments, these were government subsidized operations, generally speaking, some, sometimes privately. The, the Ecole Biblique was funds from the Catholic Church, the Dominican Order, and the, the American one was funded by American universities. But the, certainly the German one and the, and the British one were, had heavy government sponsorship behind them. But all of this opened up Jerusalem to foreign inspection in a way that had never occurred before, and even to intelligence inspection. I mean, many of the surveys that were done during this period, many of the investigations done during this period, provided, in effect, the mapping that was used during the First World War, which is only 20, 25 years in the future from some of these things. And so this was what was going on here, not only in Jerusalem, but also in a, in a larger area. At the same, you know, somewhat later, there was a an ordnance survey of, of Sinai was made. Now, as a matter of fact, there were part of the First World War was fought across Sinai, and but this had all been mapped by British engineers and by various people they recruited. And the 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 the, the survey of Sinai, for example, one of the people on it as a young sort of graduate student was T. E. Lawrence, the fam- later famous Lawrence of Arabia, was involved in this, and so this was a this is one of the the aspects of this, the intelligence aspect of this, which is really quite interesting. There's a there's a rather good book on the subject called Digging for God and Country, which that title sums up uh, by Neil Asher Silberman. The title sums up exactly what was going on here. They were digging for con- for God and country. This was these were missionaries and archaeologists who had ties to their national to national aspirations. But the, this, all of this, of course, brought money into Jerusalem, put money into the system. And so Jerusalem began to revive during, during this period. There was a kind of foreign presence that brought some money into the, into this, the city. But it didn't put money, this is, this circulates in a different way, obviously, that the government can't be quite so extortionate with the representatives of the great powers of Europe as they can be with the clerics of Jerusalem. The Franciscans, Armenians, Georgians, Greeks, and others. So they have to be more careful, and they can't they can't lean the same way. The people they had leaned on, the religious, the the clerics of Jerusalem, the native clerics of Jerusalem, the people who had been there all the time, they were the ones who were in in serious trouble, and they were in serious trouble, as I pointed out earlier, because the pilgrimage business and the tourist business, the tourist business, the pilgrimage business had declined. And the tourist business had not quite yet kicked in. I think probably one date that, I mean, about a kind of watershed date is when you get to about 1880, uh, the pilgrimage pilgrimage has almost entirely disappeared as such. There are still pilgrims, even today, there are still pilgrims coming to Jerusalem. But by 1880, I think most of the pilgrims had been exchanged for people who could be called travelers. Right? That is to say, people on the Grand Tour. There was a Cook's agency open, a travel agency open in Jerusalem. You could get now guides. These are all secular enterprises. But meanwhile, in the background is still these these religious groups that have been in Jerusalem, as I say, for almost from the beginning. Uh, and the only way they existed, the only way they can continue to exist, was by subsidy from outside sources. The outside sources had always been interested in these people because they were, in effect, their religious representatives in, in Jerusalem. Franciscans were were the as as I mentioned many times were the Latin representatives originally. Uh, the thing was that they were not the papacy didn't support the Franciscans. The, the Franciscans had to support themselves, and they were run pretty much out of France for a long time. Except that the the, the personnel. The actual Franciscans in in Italy, uh, in Jerusalem, were Italians and Spaniards and all sorts of people, and didn't quite take to the idea of this kind of French control. So there were sort of interior problems. But the, the Franciscans, like the others, had to they had to live on the support of other people. And 
in some of these places, they in some in case of some of these communities, the outside support became very problematic. One of the one of the people, one of the peoples who saved really uh, a lot of this religious enterprise, particularly of Eastern Christians, were was was Russia. Russia was new on the scene. Russia was a new great power by 18th and 19th century, and was was sort of expanding its muscles in the Middle East. It had it had joined the power game, uh, and one of the places the, the power game, the great game, was played in Central Asia, of course, Afghanistan, Iran. That was where Russia and Britain played the the great game. But it also played out on a smaller level inside of Palestine as well, because where the shuffling was about the the protectorate, who was going to protect whom, who, which of these minority religious groups belonged to whom. And that, for example, there was a an, an international incident, an enormous incidental international incident, when a fire destroyed part of the church in the Nativity in Bethlehem, and it melted the silver star that marked the place, the site under which that Jesus had been born. Underground is the bedrock, and over it is a hole, and around it is a silver star. This was destroyed in a fire. The question was, who would replace it? Would it be the Russians? Would it be the French? Would it be the British? Well, it it <laughs> the, the problem was in Bethlehem, but the war that eventually settled the issue was fought in the cr- Crimea. The, the, these things had all sorts of repercussions, these events that went on. And this was power politics. This was great power politics going on in inside of uh, inside of Jerusalem. But meanwhile, the the local the local communities had to do as best they could. But the point I was making is that Russia, the arrival of Russia on the scene, what meant infusion of new money into the city to for the for the support of the Orthodox community, particularly the Greek Orthodox community. The Russians, in a sense, and and also Russian monks began to live in the city as well. And this Russian support carried some of these Eastern groups over the really hard places. The Franciscans could always count on some European power coming to their assistance, but the Easterners were not so lucky, nor were the Jews for a while. Industrially speaking, I mean, the the, the industry of, of Jerusalem was, as I pointed out a number of times, the, the pilgrimage business. And either through lodgings, either putting up the pilgrims or entry fees, which went into the pockets of the government generally, but there was also the manufacturing side of this. There was clearly, from, from what visitors tell us in the 19th century, there was a considerable cottage industry in Jerusalem making out of either wood or stone or mother of pearl things like crosses, crucifixes, rosaries, reliquaries, all sorts of souv- pious and religious souvenirs, uh, which are it's much the same as it is today, except... Uh, I think the difference is that a great deal more of it is sold in Bethlehem today than than, uh, was once the case. The Christian focus, interestingly, has shifted uh, a little bit away from Easter in Jerusalem to Christmas in in Bethlehem. It wasn't that way throughout most of the period of the history of the city. The focus was on Easter at at the site of the Holy Sepulchre. But more recently, Bethlehem has, has, has grown in importance in this. At any rate, it's the manufacture of these goods, which were sold to pilgrims, tourists, travelers, plus the fact that they were also exported. They were sent abroad. And so these olive wood crosses, rosaries, etc., uh, manger scenes, uh, the, all, of those, all of those kinds of souvenirs was, the, was really the manufacturing industry of Jerusalem. And a lot of people... Uh, not only the Franciscans, the, who had a warehouse full with these things, but also the Greeks and the Armenians and the Copts all did a, a substantial business in making them and selling them to, to visitors to the city. One visitor to the city, a rather, from an American point of view, a rather famous one, was Mark Twain. Mark Twain uh, gave Americans their first real glance at, the, at Jerusalem and the goings on there, in the sense that he brought the city to a very wide audience by writing a bestseller. It's called Innocents Abroad. And it appeared in 1869 and sold very well from then on and became probably the most famous uh, travel book for the next, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years. It was it was read by lots of Americans and got their first and maybe their only view of the city. Now, it's not as if Americans were not interested in Jerusalem. 
that American Protestantism was was exceedingly interested in Jerusalem, as it is today, it, because there's a kind of millennial aspect to the city which attracted attention. And it was also Protestants were attempting to get back to the Bible, so their interest in the Bible as opposed to the church also focused their attention on biblical sites. And the biblical sites were coming into a kind of reality in the 19th century. Anyway, Mark Twain was a not interested in the Bible as such, and he was probably not interested in Jerusalem as such. He was interested in travel and in making a living as a travel writer. And he had written some uh, travel pieces for the Alta, for Alta California, a um, San Francisco newspaper. And the newspaper commissioned him, or paid, gave, you know, underwrote this thing, that he should take a cruise. Uh, that he should join a cruise that was uh, already prepared to go to Europe on a ship called the Quaker City. And this occurred in 1867. And uh, he begins his account that that is later published as Innocents Abroad by saying this book is a record of a pleasure trip. It is only a record of a picnic. It has a purpose, which is to suggest the reader how he would likely be likely to see Europe and the East if he looked at it with, the, with his own eyes, instead of the eyes of those who traveled in those countries before him. So it's going to be this typical American fresh look at uh, Europe and the Holy Land. All right? it is, so his, his uh, observations on Europe don't particularly interest us at this point. It's what he, what he saw in, in the Holy Land, in Jerusalem. It's an interesting trip, obviously, and Mark Twain is an interesting writer, and brings his own particular flavor to these things. Uh, when he gets to the Middle East, the way the thing unfolds is he gets off the ship with a number of others at Beirut, and they take one of the excursion options, which is to go inland, to travel inland across what is today Lebanon, and then down to Damascus, and then approach Jerusalem that way, and then join the ship later. Right? That's instead of t- instead of sailing on the ship to to Jaffa and getting off there. So he's has a, he has an experience of an inland uh, inland journey, and he was traveling there at the August and early September, in very hot season. He wasn't there. This wasn't the Easter time kind of thing. So he and his companions arrived in Jerusalem in sometime in the last days of September of 1867, and that's the view that he gives of the city. So it's in the middle of the 19th century. He doesn't tell us anything new that we don't know about Jerusalem. We have far more detailed descriptions of the city uh, by and by other 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 literary people. Uh, The French uh, historian Chateaubriand has left us a very, very elaborate description of the city. And, of course, the Germans provided their own detailed descriptions of it. But it's uh, it it brings a different it it shows us a little bit about the the consciousness, the, the sensibilities of 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 an American Protestant, and not and a skeptical. I mean, Twain is also a skeptic, whether he's whether he's religious or not. He has a general healthy and humorous skepticism about um, about uh, places. And he arrives at Jerusalem uh, and overland, so they arrive on foot, and he sees it for the first time. And he, like many others, is startled by the size of it. it uh, it's the size of a small town, small American town. But it's not, uh, it's, he doesn't find it terribly attractive. I mean, he says, this is his summing up Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a mournful and dreary and lifeless place. I wouldn't want to live there. Right? And indeed, I'm, there are very few people who would want to live there in 1867. And he is taken around the holy places. They, they are taken around by guides. And his general approach is that he tells the story of any given holy place, and then finishes it with, and and of course it's got to be true, because that's what the guide told us. It is filled with this kind of half-humorous skepticism about place. He clearly is not buying into any of this, and we get some of the sensibility behind it, like his reaction to monks. He calls the monks animal-looking Italian monks, uh, and inside the inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, he talks about the trumpery gigaws and tawdry ornamentation. He mocks the credulity about the the tomb of Adam, which he's shown, and all the other places inside inside the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. He, has to, he says he has to keep reminding himself that Christ was not crucified in a Catholic church. 
So he has he has sort of problems here. The only time that that in the whole account of the trip through Jerusalem, and he was there very not not for a long time at all. The only time he, he seems genuinely moved is he's at the site of the crucifixion, and for a moment he sort of loses it. I mean, he loses his consciousness of his surroundings. He is he is struck that he is at the place where the Son of God died, and for a very brief moment. In the account, there is a kind of sentiment washes over it, a kind of genuine religious feeling you get from this thing. But then, you know, he shakes his head and and moves on. One toward the toward the end of the account, however, he has um, has an interesting little remark. He said, "I was raised as a Protestant, and I was trained to dislike uh, everything that was Catholic." And his remarks about monks are, are not terribly favorable. But he says. But one thing I've got to say, that these these monks who run the places in, in Palestine and Jerusalem, that they take in anybody. Right? Anybody can stay with them, and they don't charge anything, they don't accept anything. They, he was moved clearly by some sort of act of charity or generosity on the part of these people whom he otherwise would, would really have despised. But the last... The last little thing about Mark Twain in Jerusalem, right? uh, he bought a Jerusalem Bible for his mother as a, as a souvenir. This ends Lecture 13.